Okay, should we, should we make a start? Welcome to this metal webinar on the legal, financial and funding support for manufacturing businesses affected by COVID-19. As, as you can see, my name's Tony Summers. I'm a partner at Carpenter Box, heading up our manufacturing sector group. Uh, on the panel today, we've got, uh, as I can see on my screen, Lou Williams at the top there. She's growth manager at Costa Capital, ready to discuss how the local LEP is providing support to companies in the area. We've got Dan Hobbs underneath there. Uh, he's a fellow partner of mine, principally a tax and VAT specialist, but has championed much of the delivery of our COVID-19 response for our clients. And Debbie Venn, a partner at DMH Stallard, with a wealth of experience in a number of areas specific to manufacturing businesses. And the attendees are still clocking up, so. Um, now, all of the attendees, I'm sorry, but you're all muted. Uh, reason for that is you can hear the panelists speak more clearly. So what that means is that you'll be able to submit questions using the chat function. Hopefully you can see the button down there. Uh, in fact, we've already got some chat coming through. Submit your questions through there and I will try and uh, then ask the panel. We've had some questions in advance as well and I'll ask the panel some of those and interspersed with the questions that come through. So forgive me if I'm trying to look in lots of different places and look a little distracted. Um, before we get going, if I'll just mention a couple of things. If we have too many questions that we don't get to cover in the time we've got allotted, we'll try and collate the questions. I'll send it out to the panelists. They'll submit their answers and then we'll send them out by email to all of you. Uh, and we may even put them on the Metal website as well. Um, to help frame the discussion for the panelists, we're gonna be throwing up some polls. Uh, and those polls will be asking different questions about some of the different topics that we'll cover. But to start with, uh, following a couple of conversations I've had recently with a few manufacturers, can I just ask this first poll? Um, if we had a Zoom event, throw up the first poll, please. If we had a Zoom event, effectively a virtual round table for manufacturing businesses, where you'd all come on, discuss various issues, share experiences, how to operate in the current environment, would you be interested in attending? Again, I said this is based on a couple of conversations recently where some people thought this would be helpful for manufacturing businesses. So, I'll, it's yes or no answer. So, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close that poll. Let's see what the answer was. We can't see what the answer was. At least we can. Oh, yes. Well, that's very good. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's close that poll then. And we're going to, I'll take that away and we'll, we'll, we'll look at doing that. Okay, in the last, first, next, next poll then, please. In the last two months, have your revenues compared to this time last year gone up? Roughly the same, slightly down, significantly down. Again, this is just the manufacturing business if you can answer this, because I know there are a few bankers and a few others that may well have joined. So five, four, three, two, one. Let's help frame the conversation. Okay, we're seeing some downturn. So I think I know where this next question will go then. Have you furloughed staff? If we put that poll up. Yes, no, no, but planning to. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's. Okay, not a surprise. Okay, well this next what question, you can answer more than one if we put that poll up and this will, I'll then throw it open to the panel to, to discuss. Which issues have caused you significant concern over the last two months? And please select all the ones that apply. Cash flow, staffing, supply chain, relationships with customers, contract terms, social distancing measures, technology, or you're lucky and you've not really had any of these big issues. Give you a few more seconds just to click the ones that you think apply. Five, four, Three, two, one. Okay, let's see the answers to that. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna throw this open to Dan to start with then. Do those results surprise you? Uh, not at all, Tony. Uh, I, th I think we've been seeing that kind of across the board and, and across a lot of sectors. And I think manufacturing is a really interesting one because there are a handful of manufacturers which are still doing very well in these difficult times where you know they they the kind of the products they're manufacturing are, are of high demand at the moment or they're able to adapt to these kind of 
you know, the new demands of the government and help provide PPE equipment and, and similar. But even when that does come into it, there's still all the issues to deal with social distancing. Can you get your staff in? Can you source all the equipment and, uh, and other things you need? And, and of course, pay for it all, because what we have seen is that th there's been a big change in, in attitude towards kind of payment. Um, amongst businesses are often asking for for things in advance uh, so you know but, but that is of course what I would say the minority for, for most businesses they're they're finding that orders are being put on hold they're being cancelled or they can't they can't get hold of the materials they need to fulfill orders and, and of course you've got a, a big workforce of people that are, are otherwise uh, ready and able to work but and if, if you can't deal with social di uh, distancing or they're unable to work because they've got childcare concerns or they're isolating, that, that's where we where furlough comes in. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely not surprised by that. OK, De Debbie, and, and sorry, Kira, can we put the uh, poll results back up on the screen just for a moment? Because a couple of people have said, could they see those numbers again? Um, are we able to drag that to one side so we're not blocking out poor Debbie? Oh, <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's not a surprise at all to see a lot of those results. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the issues that we're seeing a lot um, on the legal side is mainly around supply chain and um, how the relationship, not just with customers, but relationship with suppliers is being affected by, um, by COVID-19. And, you know, particularly in manufacturing, it's, you know, are they, um, is all of the manufacturing um, uh, work being done by one particular supplier is it being done by suppliers in different areas are there any substitute products um, that, that that you could be able to get from an alternative supplier and if you then assume and try and abandon an existing supplier contract what risk does that put you at um, from a from a legal perspective so we're seeing a lot of issues with that um, a lot of issues with force majeure as well being used as a reason for um, people not complying with a lot of their obligations and it's it's thrown up a lot of um, issues for, for very long-standing agreements as well um, it's also presented an interesting opportunity though I think for businesses to um, look at different ways of trading so we've had some interesting ones where um, it's it's thrown up uh, ways in which payments are made and actually some people aren't want, wanting to put money um, directly to a supplier they might want to use an escrow arrangement or something so that it's giving some comfort that supply is going to take place at a particular time to try and avoid delays so uh, lots of different um, uh, issues that are, um, are trying to be practically sorted out but um, having an impact on the legal side of things as well. And are you seeing more troubles or problems arising with international trade or is it just domestic as well? Um, it's a mixture, but international trade, I think, poses the most issues at the moment because um, it's the logistics involved in getting um, products over um, to the UK a lot of the time. Or if they are uh, some of the manufacturing plants, if they're um, in China, um, you know, everything's been on hold for such a long time over there. It's been hard to, um, to get any other uh, products moving forward. So um, I think international trade is probably affected more, um, but the domestic um, uh, trade, I think, is now com coming to creak quite a lot as well um, from stocks that had already been in place. Oh, OK, and, and Lou, th th those results we saw, are they echoed in the conversations you've been having with businesses? And, and how have you been able to uh, um, help businesses with the conversations you've been having? Certainly. Uh, in fact, I've been listening to quite a few manufacturers um, most of today, I must say. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that came up there was social distancing and for manufacturers that can prove to be quite problematical because if you have, if you think about the way that some manufacturers producing products, they have a flow of, 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 um, of their process and sometimes it's, it's really difficult to um, create that social distancing without having some impact on their productivity. So there, there, there will be some implications in terms of um, the effect on their bottom line because of the way that they're having to uh, produce the products at the moment. Um, and another big one that has come up um, has uh, quite a few manufacturers have been having to hang on to stock because they haven't, uh, their supply chain has been fragmented. So whereas some businesses are able to go back 
into production, others aren't. And if you can't get all your widgets in a row, then you can't produce your product. That ends up you holding rather a lot of stock, which has an implication to your cash flow. So yeah, lots, all of those are not at all surprising. We're, we're seeing them daily. Oh, okay. Now we just had a question come up on Force Majeure. So we've, we've got a poll on uh, contract terms. If we could just put that up very quickly, that'd be interesting. Uh, have you had customer suppliers attempt to vary contract terms, potentially including payment terms at all? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, no, that's, that's good that most of you haven't. Some quite a sizable number of you have, though. Um, Debbie, but one of the questions we just had in was that they've had um, some companies quoting force majeure in breaking contracts, particularly in construction, um, but presumably also in manufacturing, uh, and. What, what, what would you say is their, their legal position when yeah. someone's trying to do that? And what is the difference between force majeure and, say, a contract being frustrated? Um, well, taking force majeure, first of all, it's, um, it's a concept that I think a lot of us are familiar with in the manufacturing industry, but um, there's no predetermined legal definition of what force majeure actually means. Um, you um, have to, under English law, look at the actual contract that you've got in place um, with the other party, and that contract will dictate what happens um, in a force majeure event, and it will often define what it means by a force majeure event. Um, often it will include things like act of God, um, you know, things outside of someone's reasonable control. Um, does a pandemic, has, sorry, does a pandemic count as an act of God? It would do if it was included in the force majeure provision. So um, if it's specifically included, then yes, you can rely on the force majeure clause to relieve you from your obligations under a contract in the event of a pandemic or epidemic or any of the other defined terms. Now, if it's not specifically defined, but there is a wide enough example given, so for example, governmental action, that would cover, for example, what the government has done in order to try and include things like social distancing and other things where there has been a lockdown which has prevented um, somebody being able to comply with their obligations. Now, what happens with um, uh, in a force majeure event, again, is generally dictated by the contract. It normally allows for a relief um, if, uh, in case there's a delay. Um, and it might also relieve somebody if they can't perform the contract at all. However, whether or not there is then other wording in the contract which says if this carries on for X number of months, then one of the other party can terminate the contract. That is very much down to the wording in the force majeure provisions. I have looked at more force majeure provisions than I had done at law college in the last two months. It has been absolutely um, tremendous, the variations that you get on these clauses. And whether or not someone can rely on it is down to the wording of the contract. So it's a case of looking at that and seeing whether or not you're trying to rely on it yourself. And if you can, because sometimes it's only um, applicable to one party. Um, sometimes if it's open to both parties, both parties can be relieved um, from their obligations under the contract. Because, for example, if you're not going to be receiving goods, you don't want to have to pay. So normally we'd want that to try and be mutual. Um, and so it's, it's as I say, there's no standard. There's nothing necessarily implied into a contract. So if the wording's not there, then um, it, the court wouldn't normally imply um, a force majeure provision, but they would look at the facts of the case. Um, so if... Uh, if it's a if for example it's frustration that's a different thing so there is a, um, a common law principle um, of frustration which exists in the uk and this effectively means that if um, uh, it is impossible or illegal um, to actually um, uh, make that contract work then it becomes frustrated. Um, now, what classifies as frustration will depend on the length of the contract. So if it's only a short-term contract for a one-off delivery, then it's very likely that you could probably rely on frustration if delivery cannot take place because um, you can't get the goods in from, from a particular country or something like that. But if it's a long-term contract, 
and you have delivery by installments or you have delivery over a certain period of time and the, the events that are happening only affect a short period of time of that contract, then it might not be considered as frustration because actually the rest of the contract could still take place once the event has taken place. So whether or not you can rely on frustration will, will depend on, on the actual contract in, in place itself. Okay. Dan, if I may come to you. Um, we saw a number of companies earlier that have claimed they're making um, job retention scheme claims. There were some announcements earlier this week made about the future of the job retention scheme. Can you briefly talk us through what those were and what you think the impact will be for companies and what planning you think they may need to think about now or in the coming weeks stroke months? Yeah, so I mean the I mean the job retention scheme has perhaps been one of the, the single biggest measures that, that the government have announced since all this happened um, that kind of affects all businesses generally. So I mean there there are very few clients I've been speaking to across all sectors that, that haven't been affected and, and haven't kind of at least furloughed some staff. So you know, this, this has been already ever evolving. We started off, it was only going to be a three month scheme, got extended to the end of June. Um, and, and following the, the Chancellor's announcement earlier, um, the scheme is now being extended to the end of October. Now, all, all that being said, it's being extended in a different uh, guise to what we currently have. So we're, we're currently in a scenario whereby you can furlough a member of staff and you can reclaim 80% of their salary and the associated national insurance and, and pension costs um, up, up to a, a kind of a salary cap of two and a half thousand pounds per month per employee. And as I say, plus, plus those kind of on costs. Now that will remain unchanged up until the end of July. Now, some of you may be aware that kind of ties in with the, the government's next stage of plans to start getting the country working again a little bit, trying to have a lot of businesses returning to work. So as, as we know, the chances, or rather the, the Prime Minister is already encouraging anyone who can't work from home to go to work, provided it is safe to do so. Um, but in, in the next phase of planning, they want to be reopening non-essential retail. They want to be uh, reopening certain leisure facilities. They want the whole country to, to try and get back towards that working environment. So once we get to the end of July, it's kind of currently expected a lot of businesses will be able to reopen and hopefully operate as close to normal as possible. Now, whether that will be possible with social distancing measures, who knows. But what they have said is whilst you'll be able to continue to use the scheme from the 1st of August up until the end of October, it will be in a new flexible uh, kind of nature. Now, it's interesting the, the use of words. They're, they're kind of promoting it as, as introducing flexibility. But what the Chancellor has said is that continued operation of the scheme from the 1st of August, the cost will be borne by both the government and the employer. Now, employers already have the, the option to, to simply just pay employees 80% of their salary, i.e. what they're reclaiming from the government, but, but equally some employers are choosing to top up that pay, maybe pay the whole extra 20%, maybe pay some of the difference. Now, what has been said is that whilst the cost will be shared by both government and employers from the 1st of August. The employee will be no worse off. They will still be entitled to the same benefits they're entitled to today. So if we took a simplistic example of someone who's earning £2,500 a month normally, under the furlough scheme, they'll be entitled to £2,000, which is funded by the government. Now, from the 1st of August, the implication is that employee will still be able to get that £2,000 a month. But what's not clear at the moment is how much of that the government is going to be reimbursed. Now, this was all kind of announced under the guise of allowing flexibility and allowing employees to work, return to work part time while still benefiting from the furlough scheme. One of the principal problems with the scheme at the moment is very much all or nothing. Once an employee is furloughed, they are not allowed to do any work whatsoever for the organisation. Now, 
that that can be quite difficult because I mean I've been speaking to plenty of businesses who you know the reality is they do have some work for the employees to do they just can't fill all their hours but they're currently in this kind of difficult position where you know if you're saying to an employee I can only really put you on half your normal hours for half your normal pay or I can put you on zero of your normal hours for 80 percent pay it's a bit of a no-brainer and it almost feels a bit unfair to the employee to make them work half time for the half pay when one of their colleagues is kind of sitting at home and, and, and getting kind of 80 percent so the implication of what's been said is that in principle employees will perhaps be able to return to work on might be 50 percent of their normal hours and um, be paid by the employer for that time and that the, the remainder that they're still unable to work will be at least partially funded by the government. Now, what's not clear at this stage is whether or not the government's going to pay the full 80% of those hours that still aren't being worked, or if they're only going to pay for a portion of that. Um, there have been some previous leaks and speculation that the, the government contribution might go down to something like 50 or 60%, um, but that is very much speculation at this stage. Uh, the, the Chancellor has said there will be more details published before the end of this month, uh, pending kind of consultation with some business bodies. Uh, but I, I think all businesses have got to be prepared once we get past the end of July, the cost of having employees not working uh, will increase from, from where we stand at the moment in that it, it can be cost neutral in many cases. So I think effective planning you can do now a lot of it's going to be kind of watch this space and see what the detail is when it comes out towards the end of the month. But I think all businesses start needing to be thinking about, you know, if if these kind of measures are kind of starting to be relaxed over June and July and some element of normality returns, what are you going to need out of your workforce? Are you going to need everyone to return? Are you going to need some employees to return? Or, or indeed, is part-time working potentially a, a sensible option rather than perhaps bringing all the workforce back at once or, or, or what some businesses might be considering bringing back half their workforce and, and maybe considering redundancy for the rest. Is, is there a, a potentially a better alternative have people working on reduced hours for a period of time whilst, whilst trade is picking up? Um, and all of that could perhaps even help with social distancing measures where having your normal workforce of 20 staff return to a space where you can't adequately keep everyone the, the required two metres apart and, and all the other protections. So it is really starting to think about what is the workplace going to look like when people start returning. Okay. Uh, just because we had 100% of the participants saying cash flow was an issue, the other obviously big thing that the government has put in is the C-bills. If we can quickly bring up the C-bills poll. Um, this, the C-bills poll, have you tried to obtain a C-bill poll? Yes, we have one. Yes, but we failed. No, but we plan to. No, we won't because we won't need one. No, because we've obtained a bounce back loan or we plan to get a bounce back loan or you don't know what C-bills is. Can you quickly answer that one? Uh, and then I'll frame the next question to Dan on this. Five, four, three, two, one. And the answers. Okay, yes. Now that's interesting. At the beginning, when the C-bills first came out, then the banks were under a lot of uh, criticism because they weren't making uh, it easy, perhaps, for um, companies to actually obtain a C-bills loan. That seems to have changed um, in that we've got quite a few there that are saying, yes, they've got one. What is the process currently? Um, what are the banks looking for? How, how has that has that process notably changed? And is is there a variation between the different banks? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, first of all, in terms of variation between the different banks, there's massive variation between the banks. You know, uh, one of the criticisms has been that there isn't a lot of consistency. You know, you go to one bank. And they might ask you for something completely different than another and indeed kind of the bank's approach to different sectors has been quite different as well there's clearly uh, more appetite from some banks to lend under this scheme than others um, which is kind of shown by by the numbers um, i would say the process has got 
easier recently, particularly since the requirement for personal guarantees was removed for loans up to £250,000. So uh, one of the hesitations of the banks from the outset has always been, well, whilst the government is underwriting 80% of the loan, the bank is still carrying that 20% risk. And the government has always thought that's necessary because otherwise, you know, the banks are just going to be handing out the money to everyone. They need the banks to have some risk in there. So they are making kind of still good commercial decisions. But perhaps that was a little bit too far because it meant that just unless businesses had tons of security and, and frankly, almost like they didn't need the money, it was just a safety net, the banks weren't ready to just hand over the money from the outset where, where businesses did need the money urgently in many cases. Um, we have found, particularly over the last two or three weeks, um, especially now the banks are getting processes in place, it is getting easier to borrow money. I think thankfully the manufacturing sector is probably doing better in this regard than many. Uh, the banks do seem more willing to lend. Um, and I do feel that part of that is because manufacturing businesses have lots of assets and things. So I, I feel the banks probably feel a little bit more secure by knowing that, you know, there are assets within the business that they could potentially recover some of their money should everything go wrong or, or not recover as hoped. But all of that aside, certainly one thing all the banks are asking for is they want good cash flows and forecasts so they're not expecting perhaps even the next 12 months to look great you know they they are aware that all businesses are suffering in some form or another now when looking at all this they're, they're really looking at the history of it all they, they want to know was the business good and viable was it profitable was it making money pre this happening because what they're really doing is saying well you know if you were a struggling business before all this happened is there really a good chance of us recovering our money in the future um, with, with the new kind of uncertainties and, and other struggles that brings? Dan, just on that, I've just had a question come through. Will a new co, new manufacturing company that's recently started, so in this particular instance, December 2019, so very recently started, will that manage to be eligible to get a Seabill zone? Um, in principle, uh, they would be eligible because the, the, the assessment date is the 31st of December 2019. However, all that being said, in practical terms, will you get one? I, I don't know. That might be quite difficult um, for a business that, that's that new and doesn't have that same track record. Um, I've, I've not had any personal experience of a, of a business quite, quite that timing that's tried to apply for one. Uh, but I suspect it may be difficult because we've had several businesses that are perhaps a little bit older than that, but still new, that, that it is a slow process trying to go through and, and get a decision because they just don't have that trading history um, to, to demonstrate to the banks. Um, a, a bit of irony in all of this, though, uh, w which we have seen coming up a lot, is, is kind of the criteria about business liquidity. So particularly for newer businesses, you'll often invest a lot of money in startup and you might make losses in the early days. You're only eligible for a loan under, under C bills if your accumulated losses are no more than 50% of your issued share capital. Um, now, for many small businesses, they don't have any substantial amount of, of share capital for you know, typical SME manufacturer, it might only be £100, £1,000, something along those lines. If there are accumulated losses in the business of half, half that level, then you're ineligible for, for C bills. The only qualification I would make to that, that only applies if the business is more than three years old. So we're in this kind of ironic position that a business that's been going for two and a half years, as at 31st of December 2019, that might have had substantial accumulated losses is still eligible to apply for a Siebel's loan. They, they may or may not get that. But the same business that's been operating for six months longer would be ineligible in these circumstances. Um, so, you know, there are these kind of funny nuances that, that can make it, it difficult for, for some businesses to attain funding. But I think the, the key in all of this and 
before you even consider putting forward an application, you do really need to have a look at your, your forecast for the coming 12, 24 months, what, what that's going to look like in terms of sales and costs and, and put together a cash flow. Because the one thing that, that the banks are going to want to understand is, well, if, if you do get this money, how's it going to feed in? How's it going to pay the bills? And, and, and what's it paying for? Okay. Sticking with the money theme, if I can may go to Lou, um, what's happening with the growth grants? Are they still available? Uh, the growth grants at the moment are, if you like, um, on hold. Um, they are being, they're being reconsidered um, and they may sl be slightly repurposed, but nothing is happening with the, uh, with the, gr with the growth grants um, at the moment. But we will be announcing some um, information in the next uh, couple of months. Okay. Now, one other thing I think I'll, I'll just ask you, Lou, is, is I know that um, I had a conversation with one of your colleagues, Jonathan Alderman, about the reporting that he does up to government and that he's missing um, responses from manufacturing businesses. Can you, can you, he'd love to speak to them. Can you explain briefly why? Sure, sure. So um, all of the LEPs and the growth hubs are now reporting back to um, Bayes on a weekly basis. Um, and we try to be representative of most of the sectors within the coast capital region. And if you've been ha had sight of some of the infographics that uh, Jonathan's been producing against all of the different sectors, manufacturing is not being fully represented. Um, and we are concerned that we have some really good manufacturing resources within our region and we, we're, we are not getting enough businesses um, we're not getting enough uh, uh, of information from those biz from manufacturing businesses to send back to base. So, hence, we would love more manufacturers to be um, to take part in the survey. Um, I don't. It, it's it's much um, shorter than the Brexit surveys. <laughs> if you if you experience those, much shorter than those. Um, but it does ask some really important questions, and it does inform. Um, government about uh, what's happening within our region and that's really really important for future funding so um, I'd encourage all of all of the manufacturers within metal to um, to get in touch and I think Tony's going to give you some uh, links into how you can get involved in that but Jonathan um, Alderman who's uh, running all those reports would be delighted to hear from you all. And I think you said it would only be a 10-15 minute conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I, th I think, well, maybe, maybe some manufacturers want to go into a bit more detail. So, yeah, about 20 minutes, half an hour at the most. OK, well, well as, as, as you say, I'll, I'll, to this, to the unanswered questions, uh, we'll send out to everybody after this particular webinar and I'll include Jonathan's contact details in there because I think it'd be useful if, if, if we did have more manufacturing input into that, into those reports. Um, it, where shall I go next? I'll, I'll go over to... Let's go to, I've got a question here, uh, to Dan. Um, Dan, someone sent in something saying, I saw an MHA Carpenter Box blog on R&D and a possible conflict it may have with Seabills loans. Can you elaborate as we do a lot of R&D work? Yeah, th th this is something that's really kind of come to the forefront recently and it is particularly relevant for the, the manufacturing sector. Um, th there's lots and lots of businesses, SME in the manufacturing sector that, that do kind of research and development work and claim research and development tax credits from, from HMRC. Now, this all kind of falls to be classified as something called state aid and it's kind of something, a, a European Union concept. And there are limits on how much state aid a business can have and still benefit from R&D tax credits. Now, C-bills is considered to be state aid because of its preferential terms to business. So anyone who is in receipt of a C-bills loan may not be able to reclaim R&D tax credits to the same extent that they have done previously. Now, I say may there because it does kind of depend on what the funds are used for and whether or not it's possible to segregate and show whether any of it's been used for R&D activities. Um, it, it, it won't 
preclude an R&D claim being made, but it may have to be done under a, a different scheme called RDEC, which is designed for bus bigger businesses, uh, which long and short means it, it's a lower amount that can be reclaimed. But it, it's definitely worth having that in mind. If you do make R&D claims, particularly if they're substantial, uh, it may be worthwhile having a chat with us before you get a C-bills loan to see what the impact of that might be. Okay. Um, if I go to Debbie, quick question, um, and it, it's on employees. Um, now I know that the, the, the uh, there were some questions to the government when they announced this this whole thing about staff and trying to get them back to work. But what if what if a member of staff actually refuses to go back to work, um, saying that actually they're not they're not they they feel unsafe? Is it is it? Um. Is, yeah, there's not much guidance around this at the moment because um, you, the business would have to show that they've taken all reasonable measures to make sure that they've implemented safety measures and health safety is, is obviously being, um, uh, being paramount at the moment on that. Um, and it would depend on the employee's role as well, so it would depend what they're actually doing. So if, for example, they were on the factory line and they could, you know, they, they weren't comfortable with the fact that there was enough distancing in between themselves and somebody else on the factory line, um, it would, uh, they, they would have to have that discussion with the employer to, to either get them to put something else in place for a safety measure, or um, uh, if they refused to go back, then it would um, it would sort of depend on whether or not there was a uh, an alternative, um, whether they wanted to go into furlough or whether or not refusing to actually go back to work entirely um, actually um, meant that the employment relationship would then come to an end. Um, so I think the, a lot of it boils down to, as Lou was saying earlier on, what the what the process what the processes are for the business and what they're setting things up as. So if, for example, you need um, in your manufacturing process two people to be able to lift certain things or operate certain machinery and they're not going to be able to be socially distanced, then that part of the manufacturing process may either have to be adapted if it's possible to adapt it or it might not actually be able to be um, brought back online yet until um, other safety measures are being put in place. So it sort of depends on, on, on what that process is. Um, and um, my understanding from an employment law perspective, and apologies, employment law is not my specific area, but I can find out um, in a bit more detail. Um, but my understanding is that um, an employer can um, ask employees to come back um, on reduced hours um, and, um, and reduced pay if um, their jobs are potentially then open. Um, and the furlough wouldn't then apply to them or anything else. Um, but any form of uh, redundancy process would have to be done under the fair rules of um, redundancy and, and collective consultations. So um, it's, it's a case of looking at the business model. And I think as Dan was saying earlier on, looking at wh how, what proportion of staff you're able to get back and, and what parts of the business they work in um, and whether or not those roles will allow for safe um, health, safety and, and social distancing measures. And if they can, um, then being able to bring people back, hopefully on a flexible basis enough to get business back up and running again. Okay, completely unrelated industry, but I saw something today where the Premier League was trying to get players to sign up a, a, effectively a liability waiver. Is yeah. that something that would work? <laughs> um, well, you can own uh, waivers um, are generally not um, massively legally enforceable a lot of the time. Um, you cannot, um, as, a, as a business, you cannot uh, limit or exclude your liability for death or personal injury if it's been caused by your own negligence. So if, for example, um, they were trying to get people to um, waive any rights or, or sign up to say, yes, I'm coming back, even though I know that there's a risk to my health or things like that. If the business had been negligent in not putting certain safety parameters in place and somebody then fell ill with COVID-19, then the business would not be able to reduce its liability to that individual for any um, damages that they might have suffered or, or potentially um, death caused um, by, by that fact and the fact that they hadn't put those measures in place. So um, a waiver may have very little weight um, if 
the business itself is not putting in place measures and has been negligent in, in not actually getting safe procedures in place for employees. So um, any, any form of, of getting employees to sign things like that would have to be done in a very cautious way. And you'd have to feel absolutely comfortable that you've got right measures in place and have used all reasonable care, scale and extra measures to make sure that things have been, um, all safety checks have been done and that the employees would be safe in coming back. Okay, and, and, and still on employees, if I may, um, where does a company stand legally if someone who you've called back to work says they can't come to work because they've got childcare issues? Ah, um, this came up um, on, a, on a webinar yesterday, actually, and um, it, it's a matter of discussion really between the employer and the employee as to whether or not it's possible for them to um, come back to work um, or adjust their hours. Um, <clears throat> it might be if they are called back to work and they can't come back for childcare issues that it would require an amendment to their employment contract, even if it's for a period of a short period of time. Um, and that would have to be done by way of, of agreement. Uh, um, normally between the employer and the employee um, but just uh, if they could if the employee could still do their job from home even with um, sort of childcare issues but they would be able to stagger their hours for example um, if they could still do their job um, on that basis then um, the employer would find it hard I think to argue that they uh, could insist that someone could physically come back if they're able to do their job from home and have been successfully doing so for the last seven eight weeks um, so yeah it would it would depend on on what their role is and and how effective that would be by them not going back if if, if they have if their job means that they have to be in the office um, and they can't work from home then um, I think it would it would then get to a difficult position as to whether or not um, the employee would be able to carry on um, that role um, with childcare issues. Okay yeah, I'll, I'll just um, I'll just add that bear, bear in mind for, for any employer who wants employees to return but they can't because of childcare issues they are still eligible to be furloughed under under the furlough scheme so initially the furlough scheme was very much if the employer could not provide work to the employee mm -hmm. however they they did clarify at a later stage that if an employee cannot work because of caring responsibilities the employer can still furlough them even if they would otherwise have work for them to do okay which might be a better option um, for the for both parties in that in that instance, yeah. And Debbie, another, another legal question, if I may. We have quite a few of them. Um, how easy is it for parties to vary an existing contract, and how would you go about that? For example, it might well be a simple one like um, rent, for example. How do I go about reducing mm -hmm. rent uh, yep. for the factory? Or alternatively, varying different contracts that I might have in terms of supply contracts or Sure. I mean, variations um, are uh, can be agreed between the parties um, at any point of a contract. Um, what you would need to um, ensure that you're doing is making sure that if there is a process which is in your contract, whether that be for the rental of your property or whether it be for a supply chain or anything else, um, or with your customers, um, if there is a process in the contract which is already set out on how that contract needs, uh, can be varied, that process should still be followed. So if, for example, it says no variation can be made to this agreement unless it's authorised by both parties in writing, then you know that a, a sort of specific variation should be agreed in writing um, between the two parties. Now that um, you would need to um, sort of consider how long that variation might last for. So you might say we're agreeing to vary the terms but only for a specific period of time. So it might be for six months or something like that just to give relief to the parties for a period or it might actually be that you're trying to vary the terms for the rest of the term of the agreement. So it will be, um, you'll, you'll need to consider both of you sort of how long you want the variation to last for. So that's one of the points. Also, whether there's any impact on other terms. So, for example, if we're saying um, you want a rent relief or if you want some form of um, suspension of payment obligations, that generally means obviously that then there'll be a suspension of any delivery or there will be um, a quid pro quo of what 
um, that relief will be for and you'll need to make sure that any other provisions that might be affected by that are also included in that written variation. Um, variations obviously can be oral, they don't have to be in writing unless your existing contract requires them to be in writing. So it's just making sure that um, that's all being um, uh, agreed to in the right way. Um, some parties have actually agreed, um, we've been doing some work with parties who are agreeing to actually terminate an agreement. So there might not be any clauses, for example, in the existing agreement, um, which allow for termination at the moment for these types of events. But the parties have said, well, do you know what, we, we both know that this is not going, we're not going to be able to continue trading in this way. We're going to commercially agree that the arrangements are terminated and there's no further payments or, or if there is a payment due, what that amount might be. Um, and some, sometimes it can lead to, um, to a sort of an agreed um, end to an arrangement, but it um, can also uh, trigger certain other provisions as well and um, that might need to be um, varied so check my it basically check the process for any updates in your existing contracts if there's a process to follow follow that um, and ideally get it in writing um, because then it just means that everyone's clear on what those varied terms are going to be whether that's for the remainder of the contract or for a specific period of time um, and and then update each other as you go along. I think that the communication is is key in those sorts of relationships as well. Okay. And and Lou, um, why why should a manufacturing come and talk to Coastal Capital? What practical support can they get from, say, the Growth Hub? There are various different types of support that we can offer. We still are operating our um, uh, growth relationship managers who are happy to come in and have a conversation, not come in, as a, zoom in <laughs> and have a conversation with the business. Um, we are still running our one-to-one -one free clinics um, around finance and funding. Um, so tomorrow is the last day and we are considering whether we'll extend those till the end of, of May. Um, although the uptake this week hasn't been as, um, as, as, as good as it was in the, uh, the weeks around um, Easter. But I suspect because of the legislation that government have been um, issuing that most of the business owners have been trying to get their heads around the legislation and wondering how they're going to get back into work anyway. Um, we, also, um, we also offer um, the, um, we were offering the backing business, backing business uh, um, funds, but um, at the moment we've, we've issued about a million pounds worth of that fund and they're still ploughing through all of the applications. So it's, it's actually on hold at the moment. Um, we're also working um, in collaboration with um, Experience West Sussex and um, South Downs National Park um, and some local authorities. And we, run, we ran uh, today, uh, yesterday, a very successful second series in the, uh, and Debbie will know this because she was one of the experts on the panel, doing a brilliant job, I actually have to say, Debbie. Um, so there are some really good webinars um, that we are supporting. We're also working with um, Brighton University and we're about to launch in conjunction with them um, four new webinars. Uh, the first of those is going to be on the 27th of May called the Digital Device L Landscape, which looks really, really interesting. There's one on crisis innovation, and that's how to monetize innovation. What we have been finding is that a lot of businesses in these um, difficult times are actually innovating amazingly. Um, and a lot of them are struggling, and how do we monetize this? How do we make, how, how, do we, how can we repurpose the business to monetize this? So there's a, there's a whole session on that on the 29th of May. On the 1st of June, there's one called Digital Transformation. So um, mo mostly focused around um, how you can digitize your business processes and the fourth one is on um, agility and how to use agility to your own advantage so some really interesting stuff um, we are also looking at um, repurposing our um, escalator program which we were going to launch in March of this year um, but Mr Covid came along and that was put on hold so we're, we're looking at that and we're constantly working with um, all of the chambers, uh, working with all of the local authorities and 
what we want to do is not replicate what everybody else is doing. We want to add extra support. So we're, we're really trying to understand what the landscape looks like. What, what is the best type of support that we can give um, businesses in the coastal capital region? So there's a whole host of things. The best thing to do is to inquire on the Growth Hub. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do that. If you pop onto the Growth Hub and click on the COVID-19 banner, um, it will take you to a huge amount of resource on there, almost too much to read. Um, but also you can, you can either email us or you can email me. Um, we'd be happy to, um, to talk to you. But also, um, and I don't know whether you want me to mention this, Tony, or whether you want to mention it, that there's, um, there's a, a company called Digital Edge who are relaunching their digital readiness program, which is free to manufacturers. Um, and I think we're going to be giving out some information at the end of this, are we, Tony? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll include it in the email. I mean, basically, okay. I know that the Digital Edge, manif um, they're providing effectively government funded support to manufacturing businesses uh, and owners to maximise performance um, with a focus, obviously, on surviving the current crisis. And uh, it, it's, it's, fu it's funded by Innovate UK, so it's free for everybody to attend. And I know they're starting, I think, some virtual workshops in May and June. So um, that may, and the focus is on for manufacturing businesses. So that, that will be um, useful, I think. Um, I've seen some more questions pop up. Uh, forgive me if I'm... Um, while, I, while I read these questions, I'll tell you what, I'll ping out one of these other ones that I had already seen, and it's for Dan. Um, I know that the team have been doing a lot of... Um, um, job retention scheme claims, uh, but in practical terms, what, what are the things that can go wrong with making those claims? Uh, what, are, what are the issues or practical problems that you've seen with making those claims? Um, I think there, there's two, two kind of common ones that come up. Uh, the first of all, everyone needs to bear in mind that HMRC rushed this system into place in, in a lot of not a lot of time. Now they did that in four weeks, which may seem like quite a long time to get it up and running, but in HMRC terms, that, that's kind of unprecedented. So that they haven't had a lot of time for the back end. So the system is fairly straightforward, uh, but it's also very basic. So as things stand at the moment you need, very much need to make sure your claim is correct the first time round because there is no method you can amend it. Once the claim is sim submitted, you can't see it anymore, it's gone. Uh, if you realise you've forgotten an employee, you need to add someone on, there is no way you can log on and amend that. Now, you can make manual amendments by contacting HMRC, but that's an extremely lengthy process. Um, as you may appreciate, they are pretty much overwhelmed by calls. I think when we spoke to them a couple of weeks ago, they had 20 people trying to return six and a half thousand calls. Um, so it's, it's just not doable. Their, their, their time frame, they wanted to get back to people within 72 hours. At the moment, you'll be lucky if you get a call back in three weeks. So um, essentially, once a claim is submitted, it's going to take you a long time and a lot of effort to make any changes at a later date. So it's really important that all employees are included. Um, and for the right pay period. So we've seen problems arise for, for businesses, particularly in manufacturing actually, where there could be a mixture of payrolls. So some businesses have some employees perhaps on weekly payrolls, uh, hourly paid staff, um, but kind of like uh, perhaps you know, managers and, and other employees might be on a monthly payroll. In those kind of circumstances, if you're doing a claim for the month of April, it needs to include all your employees, whether they're weekly payroll, monthly payroll, because once you submit that claim, um, and we had a client initially, they, they submitted a claim uh, for all of their monthly employees, but the weekly payrolls weren't finished yet. So they thought, well, we'll do that later. But once it's submitted, they can do another one because HMRC had registered a claim for the month of April had been made. Um, the other issue is calculating how much can be reclaimed. Now, HMRC very helpfully put a calculator on the website, say use this and it'll tell you how much you can claim. Now, whilst that is helpful in some cases, it is a very basic calculator um, and it doesn't really work in all but the most simple scenario. Someone with a fixed salary, no variation, 
no extra employer contributions, etc. So the, the calculation of, of how much you can reclaim a salary or indeed how much employer's NI and pension contribution can be reclaimed can get quite complicated, particularly where you've got employees with variable earnings where they've had overtime or commissions or you know, things along those kind of lines, um, you know, just figuring out how much you can pay them can be a bit of an effort. So, so they're, they're the two main issues. I mean, in terms of using the website itself, as I said earlier, it, it is pretty straightforward. It's just a case of getting on there, putting the details in and firing off and, and waiting for HMRC to make the refund, which I am pleased to say they are doing in, in the six working days they, they promised. Okay. And, and I've, I've had a few questions. I've, I've managed to, uh, I'll, I'll condense them and I'll fire these out quickly because I don't realize we're coming up towards the end of our time. Um, if, I, if insisting employees take sick day, sorry, insisting, um, but no, let me, let me go into this. Uh, if the government insists on certain social distancing measures, which they have, but we don't have the space or facilities, to, could that be grounds for redundancy? Do we have to stay shut? Well, I don't know is, is, is the short answer to that one because, you know, it, the, it's the role that's redundant rather than necessarily your setup. Um, so the role would have to be um, made, made redundant and you wouldn't be able to, um, that, that job role would not be able to be functioned in, in, in the right way. But it's not necessarily the space. It would be a case of if, can you still operate um, your manufacturing process with social distancing rules in place. Um, if you can't, then it's not necessarily that the role's um, redundant. It might be that it's just that you can't provide that safe working environment and you have a duty of care as an employer to your employees to make sure you provide them with a safe working environment. If it means that you cannot continue your manufacturing process because you can't set things up correctly, that might then mean that though those roles are redundant because you can't actually undertake that manufacturing process. Um, so it's a case of looking at the roles, the setup, what can be offered on a safe um, basis. If you can't operate, then that would mean that that part of the business is effectively either on hold or closed. Um, and then in which case that would then lead to a redundancy. So you've got to go through the process before you do any redundancy consultations or anything like that to actually work out whether it is the roles that would end up being made, uh, being made redundant. Okay, and similar sort of question. Can, can we enforce the staff to take holiday or unpaid leave? Yeah, this actually came up um, uh, yesterday um, with a client as well and yes you can um, but um, the reason being obviously is that um, you know by the time you get to the end of uh, the calendar year you can't have everyone off during the whole month of December because they haven't been able to take holiday beforehand so yes you can insist on that depending okay. on how long in their employment contract um, how much the holiday they can take in one go so if it says you can't, can't take any more than 10 days in one consecutive period, then you can allow them to, or you can ask them to take at least two weeks in one day. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you have to go on a temporary shutdown to carry out a deep cleanse, for example, um, can we insist they take holiday, sick pay, or well, I'm not sure, sick pay, but unpaid leave? Uh, it wouldn't be sick pay. I don't think they could enforce unpaid leave. It would be a case of um, enforcing holiday during that time. So you could the, enforce um, holiday? Yeah, um, so, it, and it, I don't know how long it would take them to undertake that process, um, but the safest option would be for unpaid, uh, sorry, for holiday to be enforced in that time. Okay, I've got one, one final poll um, on how do you estimate your results for the coming 12 months, if we could put that up, this will be an interesting. So, do you estimate your results in the next 12 months to be up on the previous year, relatively static compared to the previous year, down by 10%, between 10 and 20% down, 20, 40% down, or down by more than 40%. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. And I think what we'll do is we'll put these poll results in the email that I send around so that, so that you, to save people trying to scribble them down. That, that's quite interesting that uh, a lot of people are, uh, are expecting a, a downturn. All right, I'm going to ask each of the panellists then, 
if you could leave the one parting message for all the participants watching, what would it be? Let's start with Lou, as you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my one parting thought would be to stay in touch with your customers what, by whatever means you can, but stay in touch with them because they're going to be really important in the future when you open. Okay. Dan? Uh, mine would very much be stay up to date with the latest guidance, um, it, particularly to do with the job retention scheme. Um, over the whole course of this process, the government does change and update things quite regularly. Um, and if you, you don't stay up to date and you're working on even something a couple of weeks old, you could be well out of date by then and, and could be you know, giving your employees the wrong advice or, or making the wrong decision. So um, at, at the time you are making these business decisions, make sure you're working with the most recent uh, government advice. Debbie? Yeah, I think it's probably a good time as well and an opportunity for businesses to review their current models um, and, and how they're working and whether or not any um, improvements can be made um, to those based on um, lessons that they've learned through this um, process because there will be some good um, uh, experiences that have come out from this in terms of uh, you know, maybe maybe actually getting rid of some of those horrible contracts that they didn't want to have in place anymore or, or, or bettering their relationships with both suppliers and customers alike. Um, and so, you know, trying to learn from those experiences and then putting those lessons in place to build some resilience moving forward. I think that would be um, a good opportunity to, to do that now um, and try and strengthen their trading position moving forward. If that means reviewing and varying or entering into new agreements to try and strengthen that position, then, um, then so be it. But it's a good time to, um, to take stock of where you are what you think might happen in the next 12 months and try and build towards that. Thank you, panel, for your wise words. Um, what I'm going to do is that there are a number of questions that are still unanswered. I'm going to collate those. I'm, I'm going to force the panel to, to answer those questions. And then I'll get those questions out by email to everybody else with those other things that I said we'd, we'd send um, through. So details of uh, Jonathan Alderman at Coast Capital for that interview and details of the Digi Edge Digital um, support that they're providing courtesy of Innovate UK. Um, I think, thank you for all the participants. Thank you for all the questions you've submitted. Um, many thanks for watching and keep safe out there. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye everyone. <laughs>